Um, hi guys, my name is Alessandro. I'm the CEO of uh, Cloud-Based Solutions. I'm going to present you something related to OpenStack and CentOS, which is a pretty nice marriage to say so. Um, okay, just a quick note about the company. Uh, Cloud-Based Solutions was started in Italy. As you can guess from my accent, I'm Italian. Um, we always did the .NET, Linux development, stuff like that. And then we started a branch in Timisoara, where actually I'm based right now. And um, we started working uh, on OpenStack for our internal data center stuff. We started adding Hyper-V support for it because we needed it actually internally. And uh, from that moment on, instead of taking care of uh, doing, let's say, data center related business, the simple fact, simple to say so, of uh, developing OpenStack support for Hyper-V and everything which is related to Windows, it's a business that simply exploded, okay? There is so much stuff to do. And we got in touch with so many cool companies that basically this became our main focus as a company. We are hiring a lot. The idea is that we hire the most talented DevOps that we find. And um, of course, we like to talk about OpenStack. I mean, that's what we do. A big um, difference, I can say, between what I was doing, let's say, as a Microsoft MVP, for example, until one year ago, stuff like that, which was talking about other people's technology, is that now, today, we can talk about our own stuff, I mean, what we write day by day, which is a very cool thing. This led, actually, to meeting also Karen Beer and starting hacking some stuff around that we're going to publish pretty soon. Okay, enough about us, and let's start with OpenStack. Who knows what OpenStack is? Okay, pretty good bunch of hands, I would say. Probably quite a few were from CloudBase, so I don't know how many <laughs> others know it. Um, it's an open source infrastructure as a service project. Who many knows what infrastructure as a service means? Okay, good, very well. So I don't enter in these details. Um, so very important, OpenStack doesn't take care for the moment that uh, stuff like platform as a service, software as a service, and various details, okay? It's Apache 2 licensed, okay? Which has a very important meaning. It means actually that anybody can just take it and create a proprietary version if they need it, okay? That's actually the reason why companies like HP are there, which actually base their public cloud on OpenStack, but actually they have their own private branch of on top of it. And basically all the big names are there, okay? And not all of them are there because they plan simply to release their code back to open source. Although they do it because uh, it's, f frankly, it's a suicide to create your own branch and work on it, okay? It's way easier to merge your code back into the master tree, okay? Because at that point, other people will take care of your code, okay? That's actually one of the hidden principles of open source. Why the it's the reason why even Apache 2 licensed code can work very well and it doesn't have to be GPL for that. Um, it's managed by the OpenStack Foundation. Um, there are more than 150 companies involved there, okay? Including basically all the big names out there. Starting from AM, uh, AMD, Intel, Canonical, Suzy, Red Hat, Cisco, Dell, HP, IBM, NAC, VMware, and so on. It's portable, okay? It's 99% of the people which work on it and the engineers are of course using it on top of Linux, okay? But uh, being Python code, it can work basically anywhere, okay? We are fighting day by day with quite a lot of bugs and issues related to the fact that some uh, Linux-specific things get into the code uh, so we cannot make it run on Windows, okay? So basically we file bug, we correct bug, and everything. we have everything running on Windows as well. We have luckily a very good CI infrastructure under it, which is sadly not covering Windows yet, okay? This is a big project we are working on. It's going to be released pretty soon. Releases, it has an amazingly uh, aggressive release schedule. Two releases per year. Think about traditional software, for example, Windows Server, which has a release schedule of one release every three years. Actually, it had it until this year. Uh, so two per year is very aggressive. Actually, this means that, uh, for example, uh, on the fourth, actually just before coming here, we had the latest feature freeze for the release called Havana, which is going to be released in October, okay? 
Afterwards, again in February, we are going to have another future freeze. So it's simply crazy. In the moment in which you said, oh my god, let's take two days of vacation because we finished with this release, it's already time to commit for the next one. This is one of the reasons of why OpenStack is growing so fast, because the project itself got started back in 2010, okay? So it's incredible. Um, for what is related uh, to our contribution, mm, Hyper-V got kicked out from the tree in, uh, for the SX release. We are talking about April 2012. We got involved at that point, and, um, and the, the code got merged back in Folsom, so October 2012. And for that uh, moment on, we simply maintain it. Reasons for success. Most cloud providers want a platform to embed and extend. So nobody is so crazy to develop their own platform. I mean, nobody can be another Amazon or another Asia from this perspective, okay? So Rackspace, HP, and so on, they just leveraged. Most cloud engineers want a platform which is easy to maintain and troubleshoot. Python, due to its dynamic, dynamic nature, fits perfectly the role. That's something that I was not giving necessarily too much a damn about before. Mm, think about people use, for example, to vSphere or System Center and stuff like that. Speaking with customers of huge companies in the States, companies which have thousands and thousands of servers just for their private usage, okay? Uh, Actually, their engineers are very skilled. So whenever they see a bug, they just look at the code, look at the Python traces, and whenever they write us, they just say, hey, look, here's the bug, and here's the fix, okay? They will never accept to have a closed source, something like vSphere or System Center, in which they cannot actually take a look at it. And since nowadays we have this new uh, type of uh, professional figure, which is actually the DevOps, so we don't have any more system administrators on one side and developers on the other side. Those two type of figures simply merged, okay? Of course, we have people which are more oriented on the development side and others which are more oriented on the other side, okay? But Python, for example, is the perfect trade union. It's a good, it's a decent, at least, open uh, object-oriented language. And on the other side, it's very good for scripting. So it's not an entry barrier for people which are very good, for example, with shell scripting or with PowerShell, for example, okay? And on the other side, for people used to, I don't know, C Sharp and Java and stuff like that, it's not something that they will just have their face turn around, like, I don't know, shell scripting, okay? So it's simply perfect. Um, okay, scalability is another of the reasons why it's succeeding so much, okay? It scales from just one test virtual machine in which you install everything up to thousands and thousands of servers, okay? I, unfortunately, I cannot give you numbers. Uh, the only customer, um, um, let's say, the only entity of which I can give you some details, it's uh, CERN uh, from Geneva for the simple reason that their data is, of course, public, okay? And they have uh, currently something like 1,500 uh, servers on Hyper-V and 1,500 on KVM, okay? Talking about only physical servers. And believe me, this is a small deployment. Um, great support for multiple hypervisors. So a few years ago, the hypervisor was the big deal, okay? A few years ago, VMware was simply, you know, kicking everybody's ass just because they had the best possible solution out there, okay? And just having something on which to put your virtual machine was a big deal. Nowadays, you have a lot of products which more or less do the same thing. Uh, of course, VMware is 6i. Uh, of course, KVM, Xen, Hyper-V, of course, um, Xen Server, and way more, okay? They got leverage. They more or less do the same thing. Okay, they are a bit better on something, a bit better on the other side. It's more or less ju just like going out and buying a car today. If it's a Toyota, if it's a Fiat or whatever, it's more or less the same, okay? There are some small differences, but it's not something that's changing really the game. So the hypervisor got commoditized. So it's not more so important. It's important what's sitting on top of it nowadays. And that's OpenStack or CloudStack or Open Nebula or whatever you guys prefer. Sorry, guys. Okay. Um, let me see something else. Okay, let's skip this one. Drawbacks. The, set the setup experience is dramatic. Whoever tried to deploy um, OpenStack, 
Okay. Did you, did you enjoy it? Okay. That's actually the point. It's painful. I usually um, put it this way. Think about Linux. I don't know how many of you were actually using Linux back in the early 90s, okay? But it was more or less the same thing. I mean, it was great because it was a lot of hacking, compiling, and everything, okay? But in the end, getting from uh, zero to deployed server was probably a couple of days of work, okay? Nowadays, you just put a CD and that's it, okay? Uh, um, OpenStack is getting through the same process. And RDO, the main topic of our conversation today, of our session, it's actually showing you that it's possible to have a painful deployment in just a matter of minutes. There are, of course, some new youth issues. So the project is, anyway, maturing really fast. But, of course, there are issues, bugs, and everything. We are still talking about something which got released three years ago. The user interface, from my personal opinion, totally sucks, okay? User interface as the graphical user interface. Not that I personally use it much. I mean, I prefer to use, of course, the uh, command line tools. But if you compare it with Open Nebula, which has a great interface, or even with uh, CloudStack, there is simply no comparison. It's, frankly, crappy. But, again, uh, most of the partners don't care about this because they create their own user interface. Think about HP, think about Rackspace, stuff like that, okay? How to deploy? As I was saying, the industry is shaping up, and a lot of companies, including us, of course, are seeing a lot of business out of how to do this. There are the typical scenario in which you run into is DevStack. But DevStack is made for developers. It's not for production. The good part in DevStack is that any time that you run stack.sh, okay, you're basically wiping up everything and restarting with code, which typically comes straight at, out of the GitHub trees, okay? So you're not using a stable release. You're using the latest development release. Even if you're saying a target, for example, the previous branch, let's say Grizzly, in the end, you're still targeting the development branch of Grizzly, okay? Where actually the various bugs are committed and everything, okay? So don't mix the two things. Are you guys developers? I mean, are you developing on OpenStack? Are you planning to do something or to test the new features which are coming out with the next feature? DevStack is for you. Are you guys planning to use DevStack to do a commercial deployment? No way, okay? Not even a proof of concept because you're, proofing, you're doing a proof of concept of a development environment, not a proof of concept of a production environment. RDO, enter RDO, okay? Uh, so, this is a community project, okay, RDO. It's a distribution, I'm using the term distro, of course, very widely here, that runs on top of um, Red Hat Enterprise, of course, Fedora and derivatives, okay? The funny thing is that uh, Red Hat itself is very, very happy about the fact that CentOS exists and that people are deploying uh, RDO on top of CentOS, okay? If you read between the lines between, for example, some uh, recent announcements by RDOs, uh, by um, Red Hat's um, CEO. Um, CentOS simply fits perfectly the job here. Why? Um, OpenStack is not easy to deploy, especially in distributed environment. PackStack, so what they did actually in RDO is very simple. They took, of course, all the single projects from OpenStack, they created some RPMs, put it inside of the repository, and that's not enough because otherwise you will still have to take them one by one and deployment, okay? The cool thing that they did is to create PackStack, which is a very simple tool built on top of Puppet manifests, okay? Uh, who is using Puppet here? Good. Do you like it? Good. So, and, um, and frankly, this tool, it's pretty young. I mean, there are some small issues and everything, but the general design and the ideas work very, very well. I'm going to demo it for you, of course, pretty soon. So here are the basics. You can deploy your first RDO just in a matter of seconds. You just get the repo. Uh, you install Packstack and just run Packstack all in one, OK? Which actually means that you're taking all the, all the OpenStack pieces and you're just installing them on top of a machine 
physical or virtual, I don't care. If it's virtual, which is pretty useful for proof of, proof of concepts or test environment, consider that if you plan to use KVM or Xen or stuff like that, you need also to virtualize VMX or the equivalent MDF flag, okay? Or you can just use QEMO as, as an emulator, okay, and just do some basic stuff. Once here, uh, and one more thing, uh, the networking in OpenStack can be based on quantum or Nova compute. Nova compute is old and deprecated, but it's way easier to deploy. That's why currently on the RDO website, they're actually suggesting to use um, that um, line which says backstack only one OS quantum install, no, okay? But if you're serious about deploying it, forget about uh, Nova network. It's deprecated, it's disappearing in Havana, okay? the next release. When you're done, it's very handy because you have all your passwords and let's say your environment variables inside of that Keystone RC admin. You just source it and off you go, okay? Or if you are the graphical user interface type, you just go on the web interface and uh, it's ready made for you. The web interface is called Horizon here. What's next? What hypervisor are you gonna use? Uh, so out of the box, RDO is using libvirt, and libvirt works well on top of QEMO, KVM, and XAN, okay? Or you can use Hyper-V externally. It's not deployed by RDO at the moment, but it's used externally. Or XAN server, vSphere 6i, and more. If you guys want to use um, libvirt, which is of course the good idea if you want to have an RDO-only solution, and you want to use KVM as nested in a VM, okay, make sure that you have VMX enabled. And then um, you can just replace um, the libvirt type, as you can see in the novaconf file, slash etc slash nova slash novaconf from QEMO to KVM. You restart the nova compute and off you go. You're on KVM or vice versa, of course. Or you can set Xen. Uh, the CentOS project has a great, for example, uh, Xen uh, sub-project, correct? From which, by the way, pretty soon we are going to steal the kernel in the following slides. Which is here. Uh, one big limitation, the default uh, RAGL and CentOS uh, 6.4 by Consecutio, let's say, has a vintage kernel, which is the 2.632, as you probably know, okay? Uh, of course, most of the OpenV switch feature used in quantum, so on the networking components, are based on uh, some new feature that came out. Second point, uh, network, who knows what network namespaces are? Good. So network namespaces are a very cool feature actually to kind of, uh, how can express this, virtualize your network configuration in a situation in which multiple processes, okay, can actually have their own network configuration which is pretty cool. Uh, it's not enabled by default uh, in the uh, 2.6 kernel, which is used in Red Hat and in CentOS, okay? So what they did is to provide a customized kernel, which is 2.6, uh, as part of the RDO. But the funny thing is that if you are a Red Hat customer, the reason why you're using Red Hat typically is because you want support. But this kernel is not supported. So at this point, for everybody, CentOS user and Red Hat user, my personal advice, is just to use a decent and recent 3.x kernel. For example, there is a well-tested and well-maintained 3.4 available, as I was saying, as part of the Xen for CentOS project, okay? That's actually a suggestion by Karen Beer, of course. Uh, as an alternative, there is a 3.10 and probably 3.11 by, uh, by now, part of uh, El Repo, but it's untested, let's say, at your own risk, okay? But frankly, a 3.4 is way more than enough for what we need. And of course, here are the instructions, how to install it, and reboot if you need it. Okay. We are close to the first demo. Yep. So, all-in-one versus multi-node. Uh, one problem that I found out, frankly, with uh, the resources available related to OpenStack out there, not only OpenStack, also RDO, um, is the fact that everybody's saying, hey, we want to deploy a proof of concept of OpenStack, just do it on a single machine and here are the instructions. And then you say, cool, now I'm going to do in production with this. 
And you say, mm, I have to scale. I have to split all those components in a bunch of machines. Because there is no way that I put everything on a single one, okay? It's the biggest single point of failure I can create. Um, so at that point, there are no resources out there that I found. That's why we wrote uh, this page, which actually was supposed to, I mean, we are a little bit low on resolution. This is on our blog. I guess that this search is not necessary right now. Okay. So sorry for the resolution, but actually this is well what is explaining you everything, how to deploy a multi-node setup, okay? From scratch, giving you every single instruction, design details, and uh, configuration starting from networking down to automation of the configuration file and everything, okay? So I'm then gonna do a kind of a condensed version during this session. Okay, so multi-host simply means splitting your configuration around. And the bare minimum, from my opinion, that you can do is what you can see now in this slide. Um, talking about a generic role, we can identify three main roles here. Compute, network, a controller, okay? Compute is very simple, a hypervisor, plus the bare minimum services that are needed to control the hypervisor. End of the story, okay? Um, controller is the brain of all the situation, okay? The controller is where most of the services are running, like, I don't know, the APIs, uh, the scheduler, stuff like that, okay? And it's what is telling actually to all the other pieces what to do. For example, when the user says uh, boot me a machine, boot me an instance, okay, it's actually talking to the APIs, the API is talking to the scheduler and so on. All this is staying on top of the controller. There is of course also some stuff related to persistence of the configuration, which typically is a MySQL or a Postgres database. Don't get snob on this. I mean, MySQL is perfect for the simple reason that even in a complex deployment in which you have uh, 100,000 virtual machines, you have 100,000 records in that database, which is ridiculous for a database, okay? So you don't need to have whatever. I'd, I choose, frankly, Postgres or other solutions only for ease of backup, um, ease of replication and stuff like that, but that's another story. It has nothing to do with scalability. Um, and typically on top of it, you run also one of your queue services. OpenStack uses heavily MQP for all the, the internal communication. So it's either Rabbit or MQP. We're using Rabbit over here. Good, MQP? No, okay, good. We have a clear window. <laughs> um, RDO is using MQP, just that you know, for the simple reason that it's already part of uh, uh, the project uh, is developed by um, Apache, stuff like that. Anyway, you don't care too much. I mean, they're just, you know, queue services. And one of the most critical is the networking node. The networking node is simply a layer three router with a little bit of intelligence. On top of it, you put normally open with switch, but you can use other L2 solutions, okay? And the idea is that whenever a virtual machine wants to connect to the external network, let's say the internet, it has to pass through there. So the networking services role is to, okay, open a port saying this machine can go through here. And it's of course telling, hey, this machine can access a DHCP service, which is of course deployed internally. This machine can access the metadata service. This machine can or cannot route through the internet and or to other networks. For example, you may have two separate networks internally in the infrastructure that need to communicate among each other, okay? Very important for a multi-tenant scenario, if you have two customers and those customers have machines running on the same hypervisor, okay, the networks they're using have to be totally partitioned, meaning that they have to use VLANs or Jira E tunnels, VXLAN tunnels, or stuff like that, okay? Uh, anybody uses OpenV switch here? I think uh, I think the question was already asked by 
uh, in, in before doing the Open Nebula session. Um, okay, so networking is the big deal. If you think that in, uh, in, in cloud computing, uh, hypervisors are the big deal and it's, that's the past. So the big deal right now is network virtualization. We're getting on top of it as well later. Okay, so this, this is the minimal environment. Also in terms of networks, you have one management network, one data network, which is actually where your machines are chatting, okay? And one external network, which is where you are connecting to the internet. So to cut it simple, uh, for example, the controller has one network adapter. The compute nodes have two, one for management and one for the data, okay? It's also important from a security perspective. And the third one, the networking has three of them, management, external, and data, okay? You can, of course, put everything on top of one if you need it for a proof of concept, but from a security and management perspective, it's a very bad idea. Demo, getting up and stack up and running in a few minutes. Um, uh, when I met Karambir in London, um, and we start hacking about uh, the related project that we'll introduce soon, um, he introduced me to a project he did which is called Raindrops, okay? Correct me if I'm wrong, this is your personal project, right? Okay, so it's not part of CentOS right now. Okay, perfect. It's very cool. The idea is that you provide a kickstart, a configuration file, and you say, okay, build me an image. And afterwards, you just download it. It's perfect, especially in all those situations in which you have to reuse over and over the same image, it works very, very well. So we are gonna use it as well. I can make it. Okay. Um. Okay, okay. So for these demos, I'm gonna use um, um, VMware Fusion that I have here on this machine. Uh, you can use whatever. I mean, it's not, um, um, since the, I'm using a Mac, of course, I'm using Fusion, which works very well because you can say whatever about VMware, but not that their engineering levels in their product is not up to the task. It works even in virtualizing Hyper-V, which requires beside VMX also the EPT flag, okay? Which is definitely something very, very rare nowadays. We are trying very hard, uh, Gabriel over there knows something about this, in uh, virtualizing Hyper-V on top of KVM. But uh, the NAPT stuff is not yet working properly well. Okay. So. Not me, it's me. Oh, it's not. Um, okay, let me get the center here. So this is project raindrops very quickly. You have your kickstarts. For example, I have a RDO based kickstart. If I open it, I have all the simple resolutions of a kickstart file. Do you guys know what a kickstart is? Can okay, I raise your hands, Philip? Who knows? Oh, very good. Okay. And it's basically saying create the image, basic stuff, LVM, stuff like that. Um, get me a console on TPI and zero and uh, get rid of the network configuration so the next time that I boot with a different MAC address, okay, it's not uh, telling me that I already have ATH0 and creating me ATH1, okay? So it's very simple to generalize it. Once you're done with this, you create a configuration file, for example, um, this base VMDK that I have here, in which you're simply telling it type of hypervisor, I don't, I don't want to enter into the details, of course. This type, meaning that I'm going to generate a VMDK, compression, bzip, disk size 10 gigs, stuff like that, okay? Not entering into details because I think, Karambir, that we could stay here, uh, you could stay here and speak for an hour or more just about this. But I want to introduce this because I really love it. Um, so once you have a kickstart and a configuration file, you just go to a job and you say job name, Kickstart name, uh, configuration file, start. I'm not starting it because we don't need it. And
and I can go, for example, to one of the latest one that I built, uh, for example, whoop, this one. I go to results, and it's showing me the Kickstarter that has been used, a log containing the what happened. Okay, the job configuration, the config, and most important, an image URL. I just take it, W get it somewhere, and off I go, okay? This specific one, since I don't have to show you the load process itself, ended up, let me see where it ended up, here in my download folder. Okay, let me see. Um, okay, here. It ended up here, so I can create a new, continue without disk, I can say use an existing virtual disk, okay, and I'm gonna here a virtual machine and I say um, RDO base disk, okay, make a separate copy, choose, it's already detecting what's it all about, customize settings, so just give it a name, so, Champions Dojo, um, all in one, in disk I'm getting into these details because a lot of people find an entry barrier in just you know having the hardware to set up you know a proper open stack environment and stuff like that I want to show that it's very easy and you can do it just on a laptop without any problems and getting on the processor style I'm just adding two cores just to speed things up I put in two gigs and I'm getting on advanced options and then just telling uh, pass over an emulated VMX, okay? So we can actually nest a hypervisor inside of this machine. The same features more or less are in uh, VMware Player or Workstation or even KVM or XAN or stuff like that, okay? I guess we are set. Um, okay, I can start the machine. Off we go, we don't see too much for the simple reason because uh, we have a TTI, okay? So the, the text is currently going uh, to, um, um, to the TTI, to the serial port, okay? Since we are not connected to the serial port, we are not seeing it. But in a few seconds, we're gonna have the prompt. I'm preparing my joke repertory in the meantime, just to be sure. Okay, here we go, okay. Okay, that's it. If config, ETH0, it got an address, 192168209189. I forgot to remove the darn uh, UK keyboard settings that somebody put by default. I wonder who. <laughs> And I'm going here. Okay, I'm in. I guess you guys want me to do like this. Better. Okay, so I'm just in VSSH and nothing strange and so on. Uh, let me go back here get ready to do some cut and paste. Maybe like this is better. Okay, first we get the repo. So all this demo of course depends on having internet access. So let's hope that the demo gods are kind to us today. I didn't do a sacrifice before so probably it's not gonna work. Okay, basically that's it. 
And now the big deal. We are just running it with quantum enable. We don't care, I mean, for this demo, it's fine. Um, the first thing I have to do, it's giving a password. So this thing is not, I mean, the only one case, it's, uh, it's just, um, the only one case is just a specific case, okay? Um, Packstack is made uh, in such a way in which it's just saying, okay, tell me on what host you want to deploy what services. When you say only one, he's just saying, okay, you're just setting by default all the services to run here. But anyway, he's going to SSH inside to all of those hosts, even itself in this case, okay? That's why he's actually asking the password for our machine. Um, it's also generating an SSH key, deploying it, okay, in the authorized keys. So from that moment on, it will just SSH directly via public keys inside of the machine. Uh, password. Here you go. What you're having now, it's a lot of tasks based on, um, as um, we were saying, on Puppet, okay? It's just pulling down all the pieces. For example, it will detect that it needs Rabbit, sorry, um, uh, Cupid, download Cupid, install Cupid, uh, needing my MySQL, installing MySQL, okay? And all the dependencies, okay? So it's leveraging on one side, of course, the RPM structure for the dependencies. And on the other side, it's leveraging, of course, Puppet in saying what and how it has to be configured. Um, for as fast as it can be, okay, it will take, of course, a few minutes. That's why I'm just letting go and go with the slides. There is nothing much to look at than just this thing going. Um, don't be scared if some of the tasks fail because um, they still have to add some resiliency to it, meaning, you know, consider that we have to download the hell of it here. So it's sometimes one download fails and so the tasks fail. Just rerun them and he will just restart from the point at which he was stopping, okay? Um, um, one more important thing compared to DevStack, this solution is simply a deployment aid. If afterwards you're going to change the settings in style of the configuration files, it's up to you. Um, um, PackStack is not going to replace them, okay? So it's very good because you say, okay, I want to deploy another service, I do it with RDO. I want to change settings in the services, I don't have to do it with RDO. I do it like I will do it in any other OpenStack deployment. So don't confuse PackStack with OpenStack, okay? This is a deployment tool. OpenStack is the real deal. And of course, um, it's helping you in the fact that um, one thing that doesn't exist in OpenStack are, for example, the system five init type uh, scripts, okay? Here are provided as part of the RPMs. They are not part of the, uh, I don't know, GitHub repository. For the rest, it's simply the GitHub repo frozen at a given moment as part of the release, okay, and transformed in an RPM. That's it. Okay. You have questions for the moment? No? Sure. Um, we use Ruby on another product, which is Crowbar. Mm -hmm. So all the code that we have in Python is entirely 100% um, Python. So I had the code in OpenStack, sorry. Uh, that's raindrops and somebody else has to answer. <laughs> okay, whoever heard about these definitions, pets and kettles? Good? Nobody else? Okay, well, okay, beside that. Um, so the idea is pretty simple. You have two ways of looking at your virtual machines. Uh, pets, you give a name to them, usually. Uh, there are people that probably don't do that. Uh, each one has a specific role. If one dies, it's hard to replace it from an emotional perspective, of course not, from a practical deployment point of view. <laughs> um, poor scalability. 
unless you have hamsters which scale pretty well, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, cattle, you normally don't name them, usually. Um, if one dies, another will take its place. Okay, usually the first one took the place in somebody's dish, but that's a different story again. And they scale up pretty well. If you wonder from where this story comes from, I don't know it for sure, but given the fact that OpenStack started largely in Texas, I think that there is <laughs> a pretty good connection here because I don't think anybody in Europe will ever have thought about cattles and pets to define this thing. But it fits very well. Uh, so uh, think about this. You have uh, your virtual environment. You have, you have your domain server, your SQL server, I don't know, your mail server, stuff like that. If your mail server dies, you cry pretty badly usually, no? On the other side, you have the cattle. You have, for example, a web application in which you have, I don't know, web commerce, just to be the usual example, and you're getting closer to Black Friday, okay, or Christmas, or you name it. What happens is that you just scale up an enormous amount of web nodes, okay, and on the next day, you simply don't care because you get close to, I don't know, the 15th of August where nobody's doing shopping, everybody's on the seaside, okay, and at that point, uh, you just kill a lot of virtual machines and you reduce them to the minimum. That's the minimum idea. That so the applications have to be designed for this. OpenStack or any other virtualization solution, cloud solution, cannot help you if your application doesn't scale. On the other side, you have also type of scenarios in which you don't want or not need to scale. Your internal web server, your internal uh, mail server, your internal SharePoint, whatever, you don't need to scale them. You have to have full tolerance, probably, okay? But you don't need to create the application, have an application in a way in which they have to scale to support from today to tomorrow hundreds of thousands of users. Our internal mail server is perfectly suitable until we will reach thousands of developers, of um, employees and people working with us, okay? We don't care about creating a cloud out of it, okay? At the same time, we have full tolerance. If it fails, we are doomed. Or we have to buy pigeons to communicate probably, okay? So that's why, for example, there is a big fight right now in which we, we have customers in which we have, uh, hey, we went our pets on top of OpenStack. I speak with the OpenStack teams and they say, no, we don't give a damn. It's not our business, okay? So that's why there are products like vSphere and System Center which are perfectly suitable for these things, okay? And there are other products like OpenStack, CloudStack, OpenNable, and so on, or by the sake of it, Azure or Azure AWS, which are suitable for the other one, okay? This is very, very important when you think about your cloud and you scale it. Let's talk a little bit about architecture. OpenStack comes with the highest design scalability demands, okay? Distributed components can be deployment on a single server or on multiple one. RESTful APIs, bindings available for various languages, including all that. Queues, so all the communication internally is made out with queues, so great scalability. Relational database for storing the configuration, MySQL or whatever, you name it. User interface, you have um, public APIs, external. Common line interface on top of it is just a tiny layer written in Python, or of course, a user interface written in uh, uh, Python again is Django. Deployment, how do you guys deploy thousands of servers? Because again, when people thought about this product, it was largely for US customers. For example, we nowadays work mainly for US customers. We have a hard time in finding companies in Europe which <coughs> have requirements that fit actually OpenStack. <coughs> we have, of course, a few talks, a few discussions, but of course, most of them are in the States. It's simply a, a matter of how the economy works. I mean, not about better or worse. So how do we deploy so many physical servers? Puppet, Chef, Crowbar, SoulStack, okay, are perfect solutions. Crowbar is something on which we are working as well, together with Susan Dell. And uses Chef, the basic idea here is that you take your physical servers, you turn it on, you connect the cable, you go to a console and say, that server is gonna become an OpenStack controller, that other one a compute node, that other one a network node, okay? And you can say those 500 servers are all of them gonna be 
that specific compute nodes or stuff like that, okay? You press enter and the rest will be carried out by crowbar or similar solutions, okay? How does it work? Well, it's pretty simple. It's leveraging a lot PXE plus a few tricks that if I start to explain them, it takes another session, of course, in which uh, all this information gets collected in a central repository so that you know actually what server is what. But the cool part is that leveraging PXC and all these images, you can just say, go. The servers reboot, they pull out the image, they deploy, and then they have Chef, in this case, but it could be Puppet, okay, which starts getting recipes or manifest, call it however you want, down and starts applying roles. Perfect. That's the only way to go when you when you work in this thing. We did, of course, the Hyper-V work, okay? So the so-called Hyper-V bar clamps. That's what I already explained. And it has a user interface built on Ruby on Rails, as we were saying, okay? In which you just say, apply the specific proposal, go. Okay, let me do a quick introduction. Let me see also how our machine is going. Oh, we're lucky. Execution being new, network issues. No problem, another round. Okay. Now it's, it's way fast in all the pieces which already worked, okay? Of course, in all the demos I did before coming on stage, it was working perfectly, but that's again uh, part of the game. Anyway, I have a machine that finished installing, in case. Um, components. All of these are separate projects and they are fairly big by themselves, okay? All together, they're called OpenStack. The compute part is called Nova. Object storage is called Swift. Object storage, think about S3, okay? Or blob storage on Azure, stuff like that. Block storage, Cinder. Think about iSCSI, Ceph, and so on, okay? Anybody using Ceph, by the way? No? Anybody heard about Ceph? Um, image service, where basically you put your image templates. Networking, quantum. Quantum got renamed as Neutron for a simple matter of um, um, conflicts in copyrights and everything, okay? And this is new, actually. So in Grizzly, the existing official release is still called Quantum. The new one coming in October is called Neutron, okay? The command line interface, Quantum, works on Neutron as well because it's the same identical thing with a different name. I just let you think about how painful it was renaming everything in the sources, closing the parentheses. The dashboard is called Horizon. The identity is called Identity Server. Think about um, SSO, um, ACLs, and stuff like that. It's called Keystone. Metering, this is a new stuff. Uh, basically, how much your virtual machine are consuming and everything. It's called Silometer. For Havana, we contributed there the Hyper-V um, agent, which runs on the compute nodes, which is basically actually checking how much CPU, how much disk, how much network you're using, okay? Collecting somewhere, and somewhere puts on top of this layer an application which sends a bill to the user at the end of the month. So even if from an engineering perspective it's almost irrelevant, from a business perspective, without that piece, all the rest will be just an in interesting exercise in uh, cloud computing. And orchestration, which is called HEAT, it's um, leverage actually the, the way in which you deploy not single machines, but group of machines which are actually uh, having specific application roles, okay? Think about you want to deploy your application. It's made out of, I don't know, your web servers, your database servers, um, I don't know, your application servers. You don't deploy them in one, of the one at a time. You deploy all together, okay? Yes, question? Templates, which one? No, uh, they are competitive. Actually, the, the design comes straight out, li like most actually of OpenStack, to be sincere. The design comes straight out of um, um, Amazon AWS's um, cloud formation. Mm, they, are, they are using for applying um, the configurations. Uh, um, what are called the user data scripts so that I'm going to show you later, which are simply injected with cloud init, which are a, a layer be under Chef. You can absolutely use it with Chef, but this thing is not based on Chef. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, high level architecture. This is how the pieces communicate together. For example, you have um, the identity down there, which is used by everybody, because anytime, whenever you issue, I don't know, Nova boot, for example, to boot a virtual machine, okay, what you're doing is that you are um, telling, so first thing you're gonna do is to go to identity and say, hey, can I log in with these credentials? Yes, here are your token, okay? Then with that token, uh, you still ask, I still get actually from Keystone, Please tell me where I can find the Nova. And Nova tells you here is the endpoint, the URL. You connect to that URL, passing the token, and say, dear Nova, I want to boot a machine. And the machine uses this image. Nova, at that point, goes to Glance and says, uh, dear Glance, can this user boot that specific image? Yes, no, okay? If yes, here is the image, and off you go, okay? Step by step. So that's how all these pieces talk together. Um, they don't have to code, I mean, for they are completely decoupled, okay? So they talk only via API, there is no shared code in between. So for example, network and imaging, they don't have to dialogate, okay? Storage, it's only uh, addressed in case by, uh, by Glance, okay, by the image one, okay? In case it needs to go to the Swift server to get the images. On top of it, you have optionally the dashboard because of course you get information for everything. And this is the lower level graph that we will never able to show it inside here properly. All the big boxes are the decoupled services. For example, um, but let me use the mouse so it's also helpful for the people online. Um, these are, this box here are all the Nova services talking together, including the queues. Okay, this is for example, Glance, for what, no, Cinder from what I see, so block storage. On the other side you have um, Glance, then you have networking and so on. Uh, the dotted lines that you see are simply communications via queues. This is very scalable because whenever you have a request, you put it in the queue, and on the other side, you have one or multiple servers which are pulling out the request and executing it. So you can have as many as you want. And you don't have bottlenecks. Okay. Yeah, but it's irrelevant because it's doing very, very small operations, I mean. And wait. You can anyway have multiple configurations file, multiple controllers with multiple databases. And even Nova itself divided the big loads in cells, which are separated area, typically geographically separated, with separate schedulers, separate databases, and so on. So you have a multi layer hierarchy. So it's designed to scale to a point in which even you don't have even theoretical bottlenecks. I mean, uh, just to give an example, CERN runs uh, the 2,500 servers, so there are 3,000, 1,500 uh, KVM, 1,500 um, Hyper-V, okay, two controllers. So, quite interesting. Okay, MQP, it's a standard protocol, so it's very cool because you can plug in whatever you want. The database, we already discussed it. Let me see if we got an improvement behind here. Still going, which is a good thing. Um, okay, optional cache like a memcache used to improve performance on Swift. Uh, I don't want to enter into details because I don't want to give you too much information all at once. I mean, sure. Yeah, it depends on your policies with uh, memcache. Sorry? Oh, it depends on um, being actually a memory cache, okay? It's up to you to configure it in a way in which you say which are the thresholds. Yeah? No, it scaled up pretty well, frankly. I used it in various scenarios bef beside OpenStack, okay? But also even here, because Swift, for example, it's used a lot also for uh, object storage. So you have uh, um, objects like files that you share directly via their HTTP URL, okay? Yeah, well, let me finish. So you can decide actually which one you are leveraging through memcache as well, because it's not, not necessary that you do it. Of course, uh, it has no sense to 
it makes no sense to use memcache for objects which are one gig in size, for example, when you don't have the memory to do that, okay? For the rest, it's just a single entry inside of their configuration, so it's uh, their buckets, as you correctly said, yeah. So frankly, actually, it's way easier to have uh, a few big objects than a lot of small ones, except for the synchronization, okay, between the caches. But it's again up to you. Memory, it's a very expensive form of cache that in some cases you're obliged to use. And we are talking about situations which you have thousands of servers, so when you have your cache servers, you can have your terabytes of memory. So at that point, gigabytes are peanuts. But we are talking already about uh, pretty high situations, I mean. Uh, okay, local file system, RADOS, which is part of Ceph. Okay, glance, glance images. Glance, as I was saying, is where you put your, tem call them templates, that's where, for example, you call them in VMware and whatever. Uh, you have normally your, suppose wha what we did now, for example, with um, project raindrops, okay? We downloaded straight a QCOW2 image, okay? And the, the idea is that we can take that image and then put it into glance. We just have to tell, tell to glance that that image uses a QCOW2 format, okay? Uh, for Hyper-V, we will not use it. We use VHD or VHDX. Uh, or we can use the AMI, AKI, ARI format, which comes straight out of uh, uh, good old Amazon. I told you that there is a lot of rip-off from their design here, which works, so it doesn't work for, for Windows, but it's perfect for, for Linux. Plus any other type of image. I put here VMDK, for example, for um, uh, VMware, stuff like that, okay? The good part is that when you create the image, you can put their um, metadata properties. For example, the hypervisor type. This way, wha what our customers do usually is that they have given amount of KVM nodes for Linux, given amount of Hyper-V nodes for Windows. Even if Linux works very well on uh, Hyper-V, uh, there is still kind of a cultural thing, okay, uh, to say so. Frankly, uh, we became only lately the biggest underdog in cloud computing. Okay, we as Microsoft and companies working with Microsoft. For the simple reason that um, a lot of people that are still meet in the open source domain, they're like, oh, Microsoft, the evil empire, and like that, that. Oh, you're using a, a Mac? How's the story? <laughs> I mean, they, they really have a strange perception about who is the evil, and j even the conception of evilness is pretty. But that's the way it works. A lot of these people, of course, take decision in the IT domain, so it's not my job to change their mind, okay? Don't you want, you don't want to run Linux on top of Hyper-V, not my problem. I can tell you that a lot of resources spent there. Hyper-V is used inside of Azure, okay? Uh, so, and I can assure you that a lot of investment is going on to make sure that Linux work amazingly well on top of Hyper-V because of that. And actually the Hyper-V components um, are part, the so-called uh, Lin Linux integration services are part of the Linux kernel. Microsoft became one of the biggest contributors to the Linux kernel, as you probably know, because of that, okay? So times are a changing pretty fast. Anyway, that's the typical user case scenario. Hyper-V for Windows, KVM for the rest. How can the poor um, Nova know where to direct a machine? Because Nova has a scheduler with his filters, and typically has X like this. The user wants to boot a machine. Where do I boot it out of the dozen servers that I have available. Actually, it takes all the information coming from the servers, typically how much free memory do you have, uh, how much hard disk space, uh, uh, how much, basically uh, how many free resources you have, okay? And the filters that you can customize decide, okay, let's get the host with more memory, let's get the host with these specific characteristics and stuff like that, okay? Among those, you can also say, this, this image has hypervisor types for hi type Hyper-V, so let's get only a hypervisor, so a compute node, out of the Hyper-V nodes, okay? So this way the user says, boot that image, and he doesn't have to think about on what machine is gonna boot, because Nova is gonna decide based on the hypervisor properly, okay? If you don't boot it, you will get errors. You will try probably to boot a v, um, VHD on top of KVM or on Xen and vice versa. Some people are saying that you should have a universal image, which is up to some point bullcrap. For the simple reason that those images, at least sometimes, 
are optimized for the very specific hypervisor. Example, VMware, you need the VMware tools. Windows images on KVM, you need the virtual IO tools, which are another source of pain usually. Um, and stuff like that, okay? Maybe with VHDs between uh, Xen server and, and uh, Hyper-V, you can manage it, okay? But even there, you need the, the Xen tools, okay? Which you don't give a damn about having them if you run on Hyper-V. That's why, for example, we have an official Windows server image that uh, we distribute on our evaluation image that we distribute on our website, official as Microsoft granted us permission to do it, okay? And we have different copies for each hypervisor. One for KVM, one for Hyper-V. Okay, Cinder is block storage. I'm going a little bit fast on this thing, okay, because it's just, you know, to introduce you on the topics and they will require hours only for them. Another reason why OpenStack is so successful is that it has drivers and plugins for every possible vendor in the, in the industry, okay? So, for example, the block storage works with EMC, NetApp, Nexenta, HP, IBM, NFS, of course, LVM. LVM is the basic scenarios, okay, which just runs some basic stuff. And, of course, we have a Windows Storage Server 2012, okay, and more, okay. There is, for example, even um, um, H, um, Dell um, Ecologic stuff, stuff like that, okay. It's also pretty easy to write those uh, drivers. If you have some, um, in your company, if you're having your, um, your storage solution, your typical SAN, okay, and nobody ever developed a driver for it, I don't know, a, even a small one, like, I don't know, QNAP or, I don't know, whatever, okay? You can just write a driver and commit it. If it's well done, properly tested, you provide unit tested and everything, it's gonna be merged and it's gonna be part of OpenStack. So it's, it's really something which everybody can contribute it. Nova is probably the most complicated component over there. The main services are, of course, compute, which is running on the compute nodes, scheduler, which is running on the controller. It's actually the brain which decides where the machines are gonna go. Doing spawning and also doing live migration or cold migration, which you have to say, okay, this migration goes out of there and over there, okay? API, you have Nova API, EC2 compatibility. If you guys have uh, applications written to support, of course, um, Amazon. Metadata for the guests, console access, okay? which is used for graphical console. Think about VNC. Um, okay, no DMB compute, which is a new thing. Actually, in the old times, at least until the Folsom release, the compute nodes were using the database to communicate with the controller, okay? Now they use only queues, okay? There is no access to a database from there. Uh, network used to be part of it. Now it's external and same stuff for volume. Let me see, oh, looks good. So we are done here. So I switch to the demo. Installation completed successfully. And uh, we have um, a few things here. Everything worked, it's just saying that we have a dashboard and um, an interesting thing is that we have a Keystone RC admin over here. So we just source over this file. Ta-da, okay. So we have all the variables in place. If I do a Nova service list, for example, it's telling me what's the status of all the services that which are running, okay? It sucks, of course, at this resolution and everything, but it's a uh, it's a table showing you all the details, okay? Um, it's a do a glance image list. It's telling me that, for example, by default, I already have uh, an image. Ceros is a very small ready-made image that we can use, okay? Um, let's do, for example, something like this. I 
typically, I have a, um, in, in GitHub, uh, we, we keep um, a small repository with a lot of ready-made scripts, okay? So we don't have to stay there and uh, repeat all the stuff all the time, including booting, creating images, stuff like that. And, um, yeah. Git clone, let me fetch it. OpenStack dashboard. Okay. So it's just a bunch of scripts that are very, very useful, okay? For example, the um, one thing that we need to do is create a key pair, which is actually used then to log in into the machines. So this script here is simply creating uh, a keeper, so Nova, keeper, add, and so on, and adding it afterwards in um, uh, putting it as my ID RSA, okay? So I can use it later. Um, this one is creating flavors, which are just uh, a flavor. It's basically saying uh, for a given image, how much uh, this space, how much memory, and so on you're going to use it. You cannot, when you boot a machine, you cannot specify, I want that given amount of memory, that given amount of disk, and so on. You have to choose one of the available play flavors, okay? You can make them as granular as you want, but this is what typically happens in every possible cloud, you know? You boot a machine and they ask you, do you want the uh, tiny, small, medium, large, and so on, okay? It's still like being at Starbucks <laughs> from this perspective. Okay. Okay, that's what we need. Um, for example, let's take this uh, Nova Boot Zeros. Ta da, started, okay. Now I do a Nova list and I'm waiting for it to build. As it keeps building, it will stay in this stage until it will become active or it will fail for other reasons, okay? It will take a little bit, of course, because now it has to pull out the image from Glance. It will cache it in every compute node in which it, we issue this command. Of course, it's an all-in-one, so it's everything here. The next time I issue boot on the same image, it will be way faster because it creates copy and write images or differential disk, how we call them in Hyper-V, okay? which basically you have the base disk and you just create a differential one, okay? So it's a matter of a second. You can choose, of course, if you want it or not, even image based. We got to the point, we have a new feature called the live snapshotting, in which we got to booting instances in like three seconds. Because the image is snapshotted live, including the memory, okay? And whenever we start a new machine, we have the live snapshot including the memory. It's basically a resume from a snapshot getting cache on the compute node, and tap, pop. Of course, you have to do some smart ideas about how to change at that point, recognize the fact that the machine changed, so you have to assign the new stuff, a new, uh, I guess that you were going to chime in when you asked if you can go down to five minutes. I'll give you more, three seconds. Yes. How do you say that? <laughs> so, um, my idea was to, to make a snapshot of the mm -hmm. uh, RAM, and also for the drive. And uh, there's a new feature on the new kernels that can restart the kernel inside the kernel and start the new kernel without rebooting, actually rebooting the, the machine. Uh -huh. So somehow combining these ideas, you can theoretically uh, restart uh, the new Linux with a new kernel mm -hmm. and with everything that was on RAM at that moment. Yeah, that's correct. So uh, theoretically it should work. Even practically, the trickier part is um, are the third-party applications because you have to change the host name, change the key. The MAC addresses are changing, okay? So suddenly this machine never, for, from the perspective of the virtual machine, it never stops, okay? Yes, but the, 
everything can be encapsulated. Of so to is. have a virtual Mac that is encapsulated in the regarding of the physical server that is running. So it, it's uh, the only problem, as I was saying, it's only for third party applications. So if we get over there, it's working. So for my opinion, this solution is perfectly working for s control scenarios today. In, in Linux, it's pretty going pretty well. In Windows, it's a disaster because we are still, still talking in a s situation which for uh, changing the host name or joining a different active directory domain, you have to do a reboot, okay? W we know how to avoid the reboot, but it's very hacky. So now, now we work very closely with Microsoft, okay? So now we're trying to solve all these type of issues. Let's say, for the rest, I mean, it's Linux or Windows, there's not a big difference. Um, the, from the networking part, yes, even, that even the that net spaces <laughs> are working very well. Uh, that was I want to ask for the network. Uh, being a virtual switch and running in software, theoretically it can be save, saved as a state, exactly as the RAM. Yeah. Well, you can use even um, namespaces at that point. So they can uh, they can store the full stack of yeah, the network? I mean uh -huh. And they can save it and resume it? Also for example, yeah, you can save it and take this it. idea. You install uh, a complete virtual infrastructure inside one virtual machine, inside one f physical machine, yeah. a complete open stack uh, setup, and having uh, VMs that are exchanging traffic traffic between each other, yeah. and at at a moment you freeze that machine completely. Yeah. You are uh, putting in hibernate. And after you are coming from hibernate state, you yeah. just close the lid uh, for the laptop and everything goes to hibernate. Mm -hmm. If you open back the lid and uh, resume from the hibernate, theoretically everything should work as nothing happened. Every yeah. packet should work. So yeah, it's possible to, to freeze also the network traffic. So not having only a snapshot for the RAM and virtual yeah, drive, but, uh, but also for the network traffic. Also that network needs communication with other servers, and most probably you're incurring in a TCP timeout somewhere. Uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm meaning only the traffic that uh, is between machines from the same infrastructure. Which got hibernated at the same time? Yes, okay, everything, yes, sure. everything. Imagine yes, sure. the complete infrastructure is running inside the virtual okay. machine. That virtual machine, it's shut, it's uh, put it in suspense state. So after you resume that machine, everything will run yeah. normally. Yeah, it's so correct. it's possible to freeze everything, yeah. everything. In a controlled environment, as you are saying. Yes, yes. Uh, imagine even the uh, virtual consoles, the gaming consoles, are running in the same time. Uh, yeah. They are uh, hardware that which is emulated, but it's very simple hardware. Yeah. With processor at, uh, I don't know, 10 megahertz or something yeah. like that, or 32 megahertz. But in our days, we can emulate that very fast. And you can suspend and resume very fast those, uh, those Actually, kind of. I don't of know if you guys know it, but the new Xbox uh, has Hyper-V inside. Yes, yes. Similar process. So actually, I don't know, maybe in five years or 10 years, it will be very simple to restore a complete uh, open stack infrastructure mm -hmm. and in under one second. because. It will have new processors, new 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 computing power. So and for that time, for my two cents, we will not have the concept of virtual machine anymore. Even now, the layer is simply disappearing. Yes. So for, for the moment in which we reach that moment, uh, the, the shape of uh, the cloud solution will change dramatically. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. It's hypervisor dependent. We were the second ones to support it in Hyper-V. Uh, the first one was KVM, of course. And now we've even support it, um, VMware supported it. And this is possible only from the API of the command line tools or also from the dashboard? Oof, it's a good question. I, yeah, I also from the dashboard, I believe that you can live migrate. I use it so much that only if you remember it. If it doesn't, you can just add it. I mean, it's just, uh, because the dashboard is just a layer on top of the API. So if they didn't do it, you can do it in three seconds. I mean. uh, more questions? Okay, talking about, so the machine is active right now. Let me show you the famous. Um, from 
here. You can change it, of course, it's just the one that applies. So as you can see, you have your nice machine over here. Um, if I go here, I can see my instances. Of course, the resolution doesn't help. Okay. So it's here and here I can have my stuff and I can do, I can go to the console, view in the log, uh, create a snapshot, post the instance, suspend it, migrate it, uh, soft reboot it, hard reboot it, terminate it, okay? So the same things that I can do. I can, of course, from here, boot a new one, okay? I can also edit it to add uh, more stuff. In this case, I can just change the name, stuff like that. I here I can see all the other stuff that we did. For example, the flavors that we created are here. Images, the Cirrus one is here, okay? I can see its properties, change the properties. I can see the networks, routers for 3G, okay? Everything that you need. It's pretty useful to, to get familiar, okay, with it. But if you saw, for example, the Open Nebula one, there is, for my opinion, no comparison, especially on the theming one. And um, the part which is missing, which is way better, for example, in CloudStack, which is, for my opinion, the only thing which is better in CloudStack compared to this, is the, um, um, the part for the metering, okay? How much your machines were consuming and everything. Now it's mainly APIs and everything. Um, I didn't check if it's Dream or not. if we can get to the console. Yeah, here as you can see, I can see the console of my machine. Okay, root and, okay, um, uh, it looks like I didn't get it. I know it's a uh, clear. Okay, I mean, okay. Very poor, important thing. The thing that you're seeing here is AHTML. So it's no VNC, which is based on the HTML. We did the same for RDP, which are based on, our solution is based on free RDP. And we do web, uh, so it's uh, the native protocol, free RDP in our case, okay, so RDP the protocol. We have a C++ gateway, and then we do web sockets. And then we have, of course, an HTML5 canvas, similar to this. Works on any possible device. It's uh, cool. So we don't have networking, most probably. So it's pretty. My, my idea was to, of course, to give you an introduction and show you how fast it could be to, to do everything. Okay. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about what we do with Windows. Okay. So what do we do with Windows? We have a compute installer to start with. Our goal was to create an environment in which people were able to, uh, let's say Windows administrators, any Windows is admin here? Don't be shy. None of them? Okay. Um, any Windows administrator can be at home on, um, on installing OpenStack, okay. And on the other side, people used to um, uh, Python were perfectly at home, I mean to open to OpenStack on Linux, were at home as well working on Hyper-V. So basically what we did is simply wrapping all the Python stuff, okay, we did all of our code is Python even on Windows in a very familiar installer in which we take care of all the Hyper-V details. We create virtual switches, we create all the configuration files and everything. The user to the installer is telling us, for example, where the Glance host is, uh, where the Rabbit host is, all these kind of things. And we generate dynamically all the configuration files. We ask the user if he wants to use a no, uh, quantum, neutron nowadays, or Nova networking, and we start the services. What are demos on Linux here as wrapped as Windows services? So again, you want to start Nova Compute, net start Nova Compute, that's it. So even a Linux guy can be at home very fast. And as you probably know, uh, Hyper-V is free, totally, absolutely free. Not free like ES6i, where you're limited to 32, 32 gigabytes and you don't have access, I don't know, to the APIs and stuff like that. Here you have the identical, same identical feature that you have in the full Windows server. You just don't have a graphical user interface. But we don't need it, no? <laughs> 
And uh, this is a very nice comment that we had on our website. Uh, all this stuff is free, of course, okay? Part of our open source and free software involvement. This is a guy for HP which said, uh, well done, thanks, I wish the install on Linux was as easy. I giggled, I think, for a week in a, in a row after this. Okay, we have um, Cloud Init. The guest initialization side on OpenStack is called Cloud Init, okay? It's an agent which starts when the machine boots and says, okay, we have to deploy the public key keys, we have to set a host name, we have to set an IP addresses, we have to run a given amount of hit scripts, cloud formation and so on. We have to run whatever, okay? This stuff doesn't work on Windows, so we did our project. Initially, we wanted to port it, but it's too much. Cloud init is too strictly related to Linux, uh, so we had to implement our own version. Also, we didn't like it to be GPL, so we did ours Apache 2, okay? On GitHub, free. Please feel free to contribute if you have ideas. Also, four minutes, okay, then we close it. It does basically what you expect to do from a service like this, a host name, creating user, uh, cre configuring network, setting SSH, user data, resizing the file system, uh, user data batches uh, in PowerShell batch and so on, password generation, there is a Windows installer, unattended mode, and also we distribute free evaluation, official Microsoft versions, okay? By the way, the first time I came to Romania was for paragliding. So, which is a pretty nice thing because uh, first I can say that my hobby is still cloud related, okay? Second thing, we, we have all these paragliders in Alabama, as you can see in all of our <laughs> images. So it's available for free for Hyper-V, KVM, and so on. You can use it for a license. The Microsoft legal department gave us, of course, a very strict thing, which you have to tell to have the users accepting the fact they are not using it in production. There is still a borderline trick to the fact that when the machine boots, you can set with the command line a new product key and accepting a different license, which is that accept EULA. From that moment on, you're under the regular licenses, no more evaluation. So the gray part is what happens from the moment in which the machine boots to the moment in which you accept the license. Okay? Okay? Interesting, I cannot say more than this. <laughs> but the first part is still very gray, and again, these images, images are only for evaluation. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm definitely over time. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Uh, I will be around even afterwards, so, okay? Thanks, guys.